Welcome to the first session of South Press's Inclusive Language Speaker Series. South Press's Inclusive Language Speaker Series brings together researchers with various perspectives and seeks to provide editors and employees with perspectives to help make the language of scientific publishing both more accurate and more inclusive. Our panel today is on improving the language of sex and gender in science. And we have the privilege of being joined by three wonderful panelists, Kendra Albert, Paisley Kura, and Sarah Richardson. I wanna introduce our first speaker, Kendra Albert. Kendra is a technology lawyer and a scholar of computing, gender, and society. They're a clinical instructor at the Cyber Law Clinic at Harvard Law School, where they teach students to practice technology law. Kendra also serves as a lecturer in the Program on Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard University. They serve as the chair of the board of directors for the TOR project, which is the onion router, I had to look that one up, and as a member of the board of directors of the ACLU of Massachusetts. Among other publications, they've co-authored a brilliant perspective in Cell Press's journal Patterns titled Sex Trouble, Sex Gender Slippage, Sex Confusion, and Sex Obsession in Machine Learning, using electronic health records. It's well worth the read and we'll post a link to it in the chat. Kendra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here with these incredible colleagues. Um, and if you were like, what are all of those words in that cell press title? Um, or God, is someone gonna expect me to know anything about machine learning? I will explain all of those words and no, you don't need to know anything about machine learning. Um, so I'm just going to share some slides. All right, we good on slides. I always feel like, no, perfect, fantastic. Um, awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about some research that I've done um, with my uh, colleague, uh, Maggie, and co author, Maggie Dalno. So before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge their work on this. They're a, a assistant professor, professor at Swarthmore College. And the two papers I'll be drawing on when we'll have links are. Uh, our paper is This Whole Thing Smacks of Gender, Algorithmic Exclusion in Bioimpedance Based Body Composition Analysis, and Sex Trouble, um, Common Pitfalls in Incorporating Sex and Gender in Medical Machine Learning and How to Avoid Them. Um, actually, that was the earlier title. Uh, uh, Isabel gave the actual title, so, you know, uh, uh, oops. Um, glad, glad I got my mistake in the presentation out of the way nice and early. So I'm gonna sort of imagine uh, my presentation as a conversation with a well-meaning researcher who really wants to do the right thing and use inclusive and accurate uh, language in talking about sex and gender in their publications, specifically with regards to human subjects, um, but doesn't quite know how to do it. And I have named this researcher um, uh, Goofus, which I am informed is a very old reference that nobody understands. Um, but let's start with like Goofus's starting position, which I suspect hopefully none of the folks who are attending this uh, work are in. Uh, or this uh, webinar are in, but you know, but you may encounter folks who are. So Goofus says, well, sex and gender are interchangeable. I will use the two words interchangeably in my, uh, in my research because these are the same things. Well, I'm gonna sort of work off a set of baseline assumptions for this conversation, which is that folks understand that sex and gender aren't the same thing. Not totally always clear on what they are, but that part, let's just go with they're not the same. The gender is not a binary. The post gender identity and gender roles are not static. They're culturally contextual. Um, and the gender and sex are not always concordant, right? There are people for whom their gender doesn't match their sex assigned at birth. So already like, you know, uh, uh, Goofus is like set straight on these matters. Um, but you would be surprised, even if we assume that most researchers understand that sex and gender aren't the same thing, how often folks switch back and forth between these concepts without necessarily spending much time thinking about it um, or articulating why. Um, this is the first concept that we talk about in our uh, cell patterns paper. We call this sex gender slippage, which is the frequent substitution of sex and sex related terms um, for gender and vice versa, right? It's not just one direction, often reflecting underlying assumptions about the concordance of sex and gender, which is to say part of the reason this is a problem is that could be accurate for some people whose sex and gender align, but it's not accurate for everyone. And it also makes it really hard to tell what the authors are talking about. And in case you don't believe me, uh, it, frankly, I could probably challenge you to open like any journal issue that where anyone has talked about sex and gender, and I would bet you you'd see some sex and gender slippage. But the example, one of the examples we draw on in the paper is from a, a study about sort of emergency to, uh, emergency room um, administration of sort of certain kinds of uh, preventive medical services. And this 
paper in these two sections I've quoted are, is talking about the same data. So at one point they call it sex at birth, and at another point they call it gender, right? So that makes it really confusing because those things are different, but they're using them interchangeably as if they're sort of talking about the same thing. So the first sort of recommendation I have for Goofus is like, don't just switch back and forth. You know, these two concepts are different and they mean different things. Okay, Goofus says, I got it. I'm on board with that. They're not the same thing, but gender is really complicated, right? There's all these non-binary people and who knows what's going on with them and gender fluid folks. And it, it's uh, specific to particular countries and particular uh, sort of settings. It's, and it's kind of subjective. We'll just use the variable sex instead. At least everyone knows what that means. Um, ordinarily, I would actually spend much more time on this section, but frankly, we have two folks who are much more expert at talking about it than I am uh, on this panel. So let me just sort of introduce the concept that we use to kind of describe the problem with this thinking, which is sex confusion. This is the fact that any given sex variable um, holds many potential meanings, and this draws really heavily on Faisley's work, um, so I'm kind of just trying to set him up here. Um, those meanings can vary from sex assigned at birth to current gender marker on identification, and they may or may not correspond to the presence of any particular body part or hormone status. So this sex confusion incorporates basically two insights. One is that sex is socially constructed, um, and you know that set, sex is also not a binary. And the other is that oftentimes any sex variable is gathered in such a way that we can't necessarily always tell what it means. So what could sex mean? Well, in certain contexts, it means things like sex assigned at birth, but it could also mean something like chromosomes or reference to a particular secondary sex characteristic. It can mean hormone status. In the context of medical records, um, which is what the sort of sex trouble paper, paper talks about at length, it actually usually means what's on someone's ID or what their uh, sex is for sort of uh, health insurance purposes, which may or may not align with any of the rest of this stuff. So just calling a variable sex, right, is often unhelpful without an explanation of what where that variable comes from or how it was gathered because it means that you can't actually distinguish what that variable means across all of these different potential um, concepts, like different potential options. All right, so um, Goofus is like, got it. Okay, uh, sex is complicated, but it's the right variable, right? It's the right relevant variable in medical context. I can use it in medical context because that's the place where it belongs. This is where sex is relevant. Alas, um, uh, Goofus has fallen into our third pitfall that we discuss in sex trouble, um, which is what we call sex obsession. <laughs> um, this is the idea that the relevant variable for most inquiries related to sex or gender is sex. Um, and it's specifically sex assigned at birth. Now to editorialize for a second, I kind of think of this as the research representation of the concept that sex is real and gender is fake, right? Especially in medical context, folks seem to think about sex as the variable as being more sort of like uh, present in the world and in the body than concept, the sort of broader concepts of gender. And this is of course setting up some of, uh, some of Sarah's work and some of Sarah's sort of solutions. Now, sort of the best way I know how to explain, explain wh why sex obsession and sex confusion are so weird is to talk a little bit about what a sex assigned at birth variable means. Um, and for this, I'm going to turn to this incredible uh, teaching tool and activist tool produced by uh, uh, Kira Tria Denise Tree um, from a concept by Suzanne Kessler. And this is called the fallow meter. So the fallow meter is meant to sort of articulately in a very satirical way, the idea that sex assigned at birth is not some sort of deep, thoughtful chromosomal analysis or like you know, uh, some sort of important prediction. It literally involves looking at a baby's genitalia and seeing how big it is. And that is often the determination between saying it's a boy and it's a girl. This was particularly, is particularly a problem in the context of folks who are intersex, because as the telemeter points out, there's this middle ground for where for a while and to some extent still, um, the sort of suggested medical effort in order to make people fit into these girl versus boy categories um, was to in fact perform genital surgery, um, non-medically necessary genital surgery. 
So this is to say that when we talk about sex assigned at birth as sort of the sort of variable that is often used, like fixated on for the purposes of sex obsession, this is doesn't make a ton of sense because even in medical contexts, there are often more closely uh, tied particular sex characteristics that aren't sex assigned at birth. Now, the other thing to note here about why sex obsession sort of doesn't ref reflect an accurate picture of how sort of sex and gender variables work in the world is because, you know, gender and sex are both sort of biosocial variables, right? So it's impossible to reduce these just to sex alone, right? Talking about the sort of physical effects of the world on the body is not just about what sex you are assigned at birth, it's also about your gender. So this can sound all very kind of like high level and, you know, maybe a teeny bit gender theory, which, you know, uh, I teach plenty of gender theory, so I don't have a problem with that. But let me give a specific example, because I think it helps explain like why this doesn't work. So in our work on body composition, um, the, that's the paper, this whole thing smacks of gender. One of the challenges that we encountered is that many, much of the body composition research that's used as sort of the algorithmic backbone to the sort of technical systems we're talking about in that paper, doesn't actually talk much about how sex is, was determined in the very large population data sets that they were gathering. Or, okay, very large in the sense of sort of human medical studies. Uh, it's about, uh, some of those data sets are about 5,000 people. So not very large in sort of a sense of other, potentially other disciplines. The problem there is that sex assigned to birth is actually not probably the relevant variable for thinking about body composition. That is to say that hormone status actually is much more sort of predictive, uh, is much more causal of certain kinds of changes in body composition than sex assigned at birth. And that body composition also depends heavily on sort of diet and cultural factors, which are often gendered, right? You know, the pressure on women to eat salads, right, in, at least in a sort of US context or on feminine folks to eat salads, it's not necessarily about your sex assigned at birth. It's about sort of gender roles and gender expectations. That's the way gender is lived out on a physical body. So looking at sex assigned at birth in the body composition uh, context doesn't necessarily actually give us the most relevant variables, which may in fact be things like gender or hormone status. Um, not actually, you know, how big the baby's genitalia was at the time it was born. So what I want to point out here is that this is fundamentally about accuracy, right? The problem with these body composition studies is that we don't know what sex variable they used. And it's actually quite plausible that they used the wrong one in the sense that the sex variable they used is not the one that is most closely tied to the outcomes that they're actually looking at. And it makes it very difficult to use these studies to kind of generalize to populations that don't match the sort of initial assumptions that the authors used but didn't actually articulate. All right, so uh, our friend Goofus has come along with us on this journey. Uh, they've come, said sex and gender are both complicated contextual, contextually variable outworking concepts. They're used to stand in for many specific underlying variables. What do I do about that? How do I do research that reflects that? Now, there's a number of better practices, and I think Sarah will also talk about some of these, but frankly, like the one I want to highlight is the first one here, which is just please say what you did, right, where the sex or gender variable came from, and this is reflected in the new, the new author guidance, right, which is just like, that is so helpful for researchers who are like me or my colleagues who are trying to figure out exactly what you looked at. Um, there are also methods of better data collection, and I'm happy to talk about this more during Q&A, including organ inventories in the electronic health records context, or like specific gender questions aligned to phenomenon, target, targeted sampling, there's the sort of idea of data richness, and even potentially errata or corrections if you haven't done your gender or sex analysis correctly. But I want to just close, um, and my timer didn't start, so I have no idea how I'm doing on time, hopefully okay by just pointing out that this is not just this like question of kind of inclusivity, although I think that's often how it's framed. The reality is that simplistic notions of sex as like a self-evident biological category between the legs and gender as a purely social one between the ears are inaccurate. They lead to bad research, right? We wouldn't, and I think that we often wouldn't accept this kind of uncertainty with other variables that we've come to expect and understand or assume is just reasonable with regards to sex and gender variables. 
And it's not just bad research for transgender people, it's bad research for everybody. Um, I think there's often this idea that trans folks or intersex folks are the sort of like causes of these problems with these systems, when the reality was that they were always inaccurate, over, uh, over generalizing and over inclusive. And oftentimes, uh, folks who don't sort of who deviate from the norm in particular ways are just the sort of vehicle become behind by which it becomes most obvious that the uh, variable doesn't actually do what it's supposed to. Thank you. Andrew, that was totally amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and we've sent, shared the link to, to their article in Patterns too for more information. Um, and I'm just gonna move right to the next panelist right now, Paisley Curl. Paisley is a professor of political science and women and gender studies at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Paisley has written widely on transgender issues, including, sorry, my screen just shut off, that's great. Um, Paisley has written widely on transgender issues, including on topics such as discrimination, sex reclassification, and the transgender rights movement. He's the co-founder of the leading journal in transgender studies, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. Paisley's book, Sex Is As Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity is an amazing and highly recommended read. It was released this past May by New York University Press. Paisley's gonna take us outside of the scientific realm for a bit to talk about legal and administrative decision-making for defining sex. Paisley? I've been teaching on Zoom for like three years and I still forget to unmute myself. Anyways, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I want to thank Isabel Goldman for putting this panel together. And I'm really excited to be sharing a platform with Kendra and Sarah. So I am going to talk about my particular area, which is law and policy, because uh, I'm, you know, I don't really do science. But let me just talk about, and I'm going to give you a little bit of sense of my own trajectory of thinking on this as I recount like uh, the arguments of my book. So the problem that trans people face, uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, the problem that trans people um, face is, sorry, I'm going to view, view slideshow. The problem that trans people face is that um, sex, a, a transgender classification as M or F or increasingly X can change depending on what government office you're walking into. So this quote I have, um, from, oops, sorry, this quote I have from uh, from 2002 from a city council hearing that I was at, it was a trans woman was testifying, you know, just, I don't suffer from gender dysphoria, I suffer from bureaucratic dysphoria. My ID does not match my appearance. I worry every time I apply for a job, I, I apply for a job, authorize a credit card check, and so on. So, um, and this is a, a woman who couldn't get her her gender changed to M on her, her identity documents. So from a trans advocacy perspective, the problem is like the state is not getting people the right gender classifications. And that creates a real problem in terms of education, employment, work, all these kinds of all these kinds of things. And that um, that is the, the question that kind of motivated me. Um, and thinking about this and uh, let me see if I can get to the next slide. Um, there we go. So the kind, so this is the only, I'm not being like an undergraduate giving you a really text heavy slide. This is the only text heavy slide that's coming. Um, um, but the problem that I, so the problem that I was interested in is like people's sex changes, depending on what government office you're going into, you could be an M or you could be an F or more recently you could be an X. So you could be an M at selective surface and an F on your, on your birth certificate. You could have an M on your driver's license and be uh, sent to a, uh, a woman's prison. So, so every different state agency has the authority to come up with its own criteria for sex classification or sex reclassification. Um, and then even, and then judges also also have a have an opportunity to weigh in. So there's all these different, you know, uh, authorities deciding uh, what sex people, what's, what, what people's sex is. Um, and so from my perspective, I was like, okay, we have to, we have to get a better policy. You know, all the policy should be based on obviously gender identity, because that's the best way to kind of understand, you know, to, to hand out identity documents or to classify people according to how they, how they see themselves. Um, so that's just like the quick introduction to the, the way I was thinking about this. And I'm going to tell you a story. And it's really a story about the longest, um, 
the longest aha moment in the in, 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 a, a very long aha moment because you know you hear about people like brushing their teeth or walking the dog and they they come up with the the, the insight that solves their problem so this aha moment for me was like seven years long and i'll tell you the story so in the 2005 i was part of a group of people that had been convened by the city department the new york city i say new i say the city but for some people i should spell it out new york city's department of health and mental hygiene to come up with a new policy for birth certificates so since the 1970s the city had given trans people new birth certificates who who were born in the city who requested them and who had could prove they had had convertive surgery and a surgeon's report and psychiatric report and all the huge amount of barriers just to to get this new birth certificate and it's this is not the current now birth certificate but in, when we started looking at this problem it was current but if you look closely at this birth certificate there's one thing that's missing and what's missing is a box for sex so what new york city had decided to do in the 1970s is like oh we are going to uh, give people, give these poor people a uh, new birth certificate, but we're going to leave the whole box for sex off. So, and if you look at the bottom, it says this certificate is filed to pers pursuant to subsection five or subsection A, blah, 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 which is basically the transsexual subsection of the New York City health code. So anybody who looked at birth certificates all day as part of their job in, in the government or in a human resources office, this certificate would completely be outing them as a, as a, as a trans person. So, um, so the committee, which was composed of trans advocates, uh, trans health experts, officials, and, and, and medical professionals from the Bureau of Health and Mental Hygiene, and then a couple of like kind of more ancillary kind of trans or, or ancillary kind of folks from Columbia who are surgeons, came up with a policy that would basically make uh, people born in New York City who wanted a new birth certificate with a new gender market could have a have one based on their gender identity. And the committee came up with this. We all agreed. Actually, actually, one group of one, one class of people on the committee did not agree. Uh, there was a surgeon on the committee and he thought he thought the best metric for changing one's sex, the best kind of proof of changing one's sex should be, wait for it, surgery. <laughs> but anyways, he didn't come to many meetings. So his, his view didn't really hold a lot of sway. Um, so anyways, so this was a great, we we're going to have this 2005, 2006, we we're going to have this policy based on gender identity. We we're going to, and trans people would get a new birth certificate that actually had the box for sex on it. It was going to be great. Uh, and then there was just dead silence from the city there was, they didn't get back to us. They didn't talk about how to move the regulation forward. And then we found out that they had shopped it around to a bunch of different city agencies and the city agencies were totally mixed on it. Some of them were like, sure, this is fine. And some of them were like, that is not okay. We cannot have this definition. We can't have a gender identity based sex classification system in New York City. So we thought the whole thing was just completely transphobic. They were harming their transgender people, trans people who were born in the city, that it was a terrible policy. And it certainly was effectively transphobic for sure. Uh, and so eventually the city went with this policy where you could change the sex on your birth certificate and you could have a box for sex, but you'd have to have like all the surgery and psychiatric reports and the whole the whole weight of the medical model was kind of bore down on trans people born in um, born in New York City who want to change their birth certificate. So it was a very conservative policy, especially for a progressive jurisdiction like New York City. So then my aha moment actually comes um, comes um, a few years later where I'm kind of looking at the notes from all these meetings. And I'm also noticing that a, a legal group, the Transgender uh, Legal Defense and Education Fund, files a lawsuit against the city saying, hey, your birth certificate policy is mean. <laughs> That's not the language they use. They said their birth certificate policy is irrational, capricious, arbitrary, and you know it's harming these people for no good reason. And then I was like reading the reply briefs that the city filed. Um, and um, I realized that this is where my aha moment happens. The city replied, some of this stuff is I'm not, I'm giving a very short version of this talk, so I'm not going back to the 1960s. But in 2011, the city said, you know what? The existence of different approaches to similar problems, like how we classify sex, it does not render an agency's rule irrational. Because what the advocates had said is like, hey, you have a DMV policy that's different than your birth certificate policy. That makes no sense. You can't have one definition of sex for one agency and a different from a different agency. And the city agency said, actually, you know, we can. And we do, and that doesn't make our work irrational. Um, and that's kind of when, for me, the penny dropped. And 
because these officials were not particularly transphobic, but they were dealing with the folks at their different agencies who had kind of given feedback on the new policy and said, you know what, the way we the way we use sex in our um in our work wouldn't work with the gender identity policy. Or other agencies like the Department of Homeless Services said, yeah, yeah, gender identity is fine. So one of the things I realized when the my aha moment was like the trans advocates, including myself, and the city officials, we were just talking totally past each other. So we were making claims in the register of expertise and truth. And at that time, you know, the scientific community had kind of come along and we could trot out various different, you know, articles and societies and associations and so on. So we were working from the assumption that a sex classification policy should be based on the correct definition of sex. But representatives of the state were doing something very different. They were thinking it what they were thinking about sex in the register of governing and politics. And their main concern was the practical consequences of changing the world, changing the world, the rules. So you know, even though I like, you know, I did like post-structuralist feminist theory, queer theory, and I thought I'm so smart and all that kind of stuff, I realized actually, actually, the city officials are the real Foucauldians because they actually understood at a much more kind of like molecular level that like sex is like a mobile technology of governing you could actually change it's it's how it's uh change its definition based on what what this a particular state agency was trying to do and so that's comes that's where i come up with the, the main argument of the book that um sex is as sex does and let me give you another another example um i, don't, I think at this point i'm mostly out of slides but another example i noticed after i kind of had had come to this conclusion that sex that officials were looking more at the 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 effect of sex than its actual meaning was when I looked at driver's license policies back in the early 2000s even conservative states at that time had made it possible for trans people to change their driver's license policies so some states were you know you know you could almost kind of fill out a form and change it in other states you know you maybe would have to provide some medical documentation or or provide a a, a very carefully written letter from a medical professional um, but most states or almost all states whether it's but just a couple allow people to change their sex classification their driver's license so that makes so that seemed fine that seemed good it's like oh they are not transphobic at the same time, though, there are all these cases that came down. They were appellate cases involving trans people in marriage. So the situation is um, a trans person would be in a marriage to a non-trans person. And then for whatever reasons, the marriage ended in divorce or something like divorce. Uh, and then the, the, the marriage was litigated. So when most people don't um, get divorced and they litigate around property or children, in these cases involving trans marriages, um, the the non-transgender spouse would litigate the very existence of the marriage. They say, actually, the person I married was trans. So it's not a real marriage. So it's actually a same-sex marriage. So it's not a marriage. And one of the things that happened is that in almost every single case involving trans people in marriage that was litigated and published, which isn't a lot of them, but published at the appellate level, trans people were losing. And I was like, this is crazy. How could trans people always be losing these marriage cases, always find that their sex is assigned at birth for the purposes of marriage, but be able to change their driver's licenses? Like the, one of the most egregious cases in, was in Texas, where an appellate court in Texas, there's this woman named Christy Lee Littleton, and um, she, uh, she, her husband died in the hospital, and she sued the hospital. And the hospital's lawyers were like, oh, we hate malpractice cases. This sucks. What are we going to do? And they got very creative. They said, ah, she's a, she's a trans woman. Therefore, she was assigned male at birth. Therefore, she's really a man. Therefore, the public policy, the state of Texas, she's in a same-sex marriage, which isn't allowed at the time. Therefore, she is, uh, is not really married. Therefore, she has no standing to sue. And a high court in Texas agreed. They said, you know what? This is the language of the judiciary in Texas. They said, you know, a surgeon cannot change with a scalpel what God created at birth. And so, there, so she lost. And there were a bunch of cases like that. And so what I realized after a while is like, oh, the trans, the, the driver's license policies are not trans positive necessarily. Actually, the reason why 
states let people change their driver's license is that it's useful for the agency that uses these particular identity documents to track the movement of people across territory for people like to have the right sex classification on their driver's license. So for example, if I get pulled over by a police officer, it doesn't, it's not helpful for the New York state trooper to see an F on my driver's license. It doesn't help them kind of track who I am and where I'm going and where I've been. So that's why the driver's license policies were quicker to change. Marriage, however, serves a different purpose because it's all about like, you know, it's okay, it's about lovey-dovey stuff maybe, but also marriage is a legal instrument for the for the regulation of the transmission of property, you know, across generations. And the existence of trans people in marriage kind of messes up the kind of the the narrative we have that the the culture has that the the, fa the family is this kind of biological unit uh, where genes are passed on from one generation to the to the next. So that's um, those are two examples of um, where we can re see really clearly like the state agencies don't see sex as some beautiful uh, uh, platonic truth some thing in itself, but they see it more more as like something that can be shifted depending on what government's trying to do. Now we are in a very different moment. <laughs> you would think after doing all this work as an advocate and as a scholar studying these bureaucratic, uh, you know, administrative processes for coming up with new policies on sex classification, I would want to have, you know, moved beyond that. But now, now the Republicans are turning sex classification, they're politicizing it in a way that it that has never been politicized before. So even when these policies are being determined, being decided, and sometimes they didn't help transgender people, at least it was, there was some kind of rationale for it. But but now with re these Republican legislatures in all these states, just deciding how sex is going to be defined, um, you know, in schools, in bathrooms, in sports, uh, it's been politicized and it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, we're in a very different, very bad uh, moment, but it's still an ex it still is an example of like sex is like an instrument of governing. In this sense, they're using it to kind of um, re uh, re re uh, relight the culture wars. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. The last thing I'll say is that because I had you know people were talking about sex and gender. I, I, after a while in my research, I just said like I don't I am not going to I am agnostic on what sex is. So for the purposes of this project, I simply define sex as the government decision. Sex is the effect of a government decision about whether one is M or F or more recently X. Um, so that's why I use the word sex and not the word gender. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paisley. That's really amazing. Um, I remember reading the quote in your book that sex is whatever an entity whose decisions are backed by the force of law says it is. And I remember when I first read that thinking, wow, that kind of applies to scientific literature and research as well. Um, so I'm gonna move to the next, the final speaker in our panel, Sarah Richardson. Sarah is a professor of the history of science and of studies of women, gender and sexuality at Harvard University and a historian, of, historian and philosopher of, sorry, technical problems. A historian and philosopher of science specializing in the sciences of sex, gender, sexuality, and reproduction. Sarah is an author of The Maternal Imprint, The Contested Science of Maternal Fetal Effects, and Sex Itself, The Search for Male and Female in the Human Genome. She founded and directs the Gender SciLab, a collaborative interdisciplinary research lab dedicated to generating concepts, methods, and theories for biomedical research on sex and gender. Among her publications is a Cell Reports Medicine commentary titled, Why Sex as a Biological Variable Conflicts with Precision Medicine Initiatives. That's another great read, and we'll post a link to that as well in the chat. Sarah? Well, thank you so much, uh, Isabel Goldman and all who have attended this uh, symposium, and thanks to um, Kendra and Paisley for their wonderful presentations. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I always jump at the opportunity to engage with researchers. Um, for my entire career as a historian and philosopher of science, I have studied how sex is operationalized and used in practice by scientists and how scientists make judgments about when and how to employ sex-related biological variables in their research. And as a historian and philosopher of science trained in the social studies of science, I regard this as an empirical question. And um, in this work, I have had the pleasure of, again, engaging deeply with 
scientists across the life uh, sciences and biomedical fields. And so what I'm going to present to you is a sort of maturing um, understanding that I have of how this works um, through the concept of sex contextualism. And I'll try to keep this pretty basic um, as an introductory overview of the concept. So uh, to overview, um, there are two reasons that we, there, there are two main frameworks that I'm going to discuss today. Uh, one is the concept of sex essentialism, and the other is the concept of sex contextualism. Um, I'll begin by discussing reasons that we would want to attend to sex-related variation in biomedical research, and then I'll discuss some of the common pitfalls in, in this work. Then I'll review the two conceptual frameworks, and then I'll briefly discuss what sex contextualism means for the researcher in practice. So. Uh, many of you will be well aware that there is a rich ongoing debate about whether and how to attend to sex related variables in biomedical research. This has led to policy discussions at journals, at funding agencies, um, and at the, at the national uh, and regional level. Um, so there are many reasons uh, that we might want to attend to sex-related variables in biomedical research. Um, sex-related variables, including genes, hormones, reproductive organs, all play an important role in health and development. And a central concern of those who have advocated for sex as a biological variable policies is to ensure that biomedical research findings are generalizable to all people. Um, and of course, sex-related processes are important to the, to the developmental and evolutionary history of our species and the other species that we study in biology. Um, so these are all good reasons to attend to this source of variation. Um, at the same time, there is a rich literature on the treacherous pitfalls and problems uh, in biomedical research on sex differences. Um, there is a long tradition of the overstatement of differences between the sexes uh, due to lack of rigorous methods and study design. Um, there is a consistent failure in this research, and Kendra pointed to that already, to consider bodies and identities outside of the male-female sex binary. And as Paisley pointed out, there is an interface between scientific expert knowledge and policy discussions that relate to the uh, human rights of uh, trans and non-binary people and um, people of all gender identities, actually. Um, that means that uh, what I'll call essentialist and binary views of sex that emerge from the laboratory or scientific reports can contribute to and reinforce harmful binary sex essentialist views of men and women in folk ideology, in policy, in everyday discourse. So I'm gonna put my philosopher hat on. And um, when I approach an area of science, I'm always interested in the underlying set of categories that are taken for granted, um, the conceptual frameworks and models that define the research framework for a particular field. Um, so as a philosopher, it's perfectly clear to me that concepts matter a lot. They help influence the global uh, acceptability of questions that are asked, they influence the material selected for study, and then they also influence how data are aggregated and interpreted. That is, concepts drive how we operationalize our variables in science. And so our concept of sex will influence how we attend to sex as a biological variable. So, let me start with the concept of, of biological sex essentialism. This is the conceptualization of sex as maleness and as femaleness. 
If we start with that framework, we will operationalize sex as comparing categories of males and females. So biological sex essentialism drives us into a way of thinking that uh, understands maleness and femaleness as essences represented by the presence or absence of a discrete set of biochemical factors. Sex as a biological variable from this perspective is sufficiently considered when biological materials derived from both sexes are included in research and compared. And in the initial round of discussions around the development of sex as a biological variable policies, this approach has been favored in many of the journal editorial policies and federal research funding mandates. So here we're looking at the NIH policy on sex as a biological variable. And the singular direction of this policy here from the NIH guidance um, is to disaggregate and compare male and female biological materials. So the guidance from 2015 um, asks for researchers in studies using both sexes to develop a data analysis plan prospectively that at a minimum provides for the collection of data disaggregated by sex. Now, alternatively, if we conceptualize sex as variation produced by sex-related variables, that conceptual framework leads to a different setup for research and potentially different ways of aggregating data and interpreting it. We will then operationalize sex as material factors that vary among and within sex subclasses, however a researcher has defined them. So a few examples of such material factors might be hormonal milieu, anatomical features of gonads, or developmental pathways. The term sex contextualism describes this approach to conceptualizing sex as a biological variable in experimental research. So biological sex contextualism, as opposed to biological sex essentialism, um, argues that the definition of sex-related variables and whether they are relevant in biomedical research depends on the research context. In this view, no single component or set of components specifies sex across biological research programs. And variation produced by sex-related factors should be interpreted within a well-specified research context. And this means that male-female comparisons may not be necessary or sufficient to capture sex-related biological variation of interest. So of course, what, what do I mean by research context? Um, this could include a range of constraints from uh, the pragmatic interest of the researcher to interacting or mediating environmental variables, the developmental stage of the research organism or materials, and many other aspects that constrain our research contextually. So for the sex contextualist, sex-related variables gain biological meaning and emerge as relevant or not within the context of a particular research program. On this view, male and female comparisons are just one way of operationalizing sex in actual practice. That is, it results in a pluralist understanding of practical operationalizations of sex-related biological variables. Um, to make this just a tiny bit concrete, um, if you'll indulge me, I'll give a quick e example. Um, cell lines um, give a good example of uh, the context specificity of interpretations of sex-related biological variables. And lest you think that this is this question of sex contextualism um, or the need for thinking outside of sex essentialist and binary comparisons is sort of a marginal issue that only applies to a few cases, cell lines uh, such as the HeLa cell line um, have been cultured and immortalized to provide standardized research material for scientists 
uh, over many decades and form the foundation for thousands of scientific publications. So the famous HeLa cell line, which was derived from a um, woman in Baltimore in 1951, an African-American woman, the story has famously been told by Oprah and others, um, was um, originated, I guess you could say, from female cells. It's become the most widely used cell line in 20th century biomedical research. It is the basis for an astonishing 74,000 scientific publications. Now, the HeLa cell line has been shown to contain at this point, not only Henrietta Lack's genome, but also the genome of several viruses and perhaps elements of the genomes of some of the researchers who have used it, leading some to suggest that it should be actually understood and classified as its own species. Understanding this cell line as a female cell line seems almost entirely wrongheaded in this way, right? Um, and it isn't necessarily a concern that much of this cancer research was done um, to support uh, research that is clinically applicable to people uh, born as males or born as females. Um, the Another point about cell lines, we could just go on and on with this kind of example. Um, if we look at male cell lines, um, that is cell lines derived originally for, from an individual with a Y chromosome, at least 40% of male cell lines lose their Y chromosome over time. Another point about cell and tissue research, of course, is that this, these cells are grown in a medium that contains phenyl red, a weak estrogen mimic, and fetal bovine serum that contains a mix of pregnancy hormones and hormones from both male and female fetuses. This is sex contextualism. There are a variety of sex-related variables, and they're linked to the research context, and they need to be specified um, within that context. Um, in short, Male-female comparisons represent only one kind of operationalization of sex in biomedical research. Many operationalizations of male and female are actually limited not only in their generalizability to the other sex, but to all males and all females. There's considerable variation within these subclasses, these crude subclasses. Claims about male and female sex differences in a model system, um, such as rodent work, are limited in their generalizability to embodied humans. Biological material, as in the cell line case I've just discussed, often does not have a clear, stable, or functionally important sexual identity. And not all differences between males and females are accurately described as sex differences. These points are expanded upon in the public, published work if you're interested in digging in. So sex contextualism offers a framework, an alternative to biological sex essentialism. This alternative is a pragmatic, pluralist approach to sex in biomedical research, sensitive to social implications. That is consistent with what Kendra was inviting um, her goofus <laughs> to do. Sex contextualism invites researchers to justify their choices in how they operationalize sex. So in summary, sex contextualism offers an alternative framework to sex essentialism for attending to sex-related variation in laboratory-based experimental biomedical research. It recognizes that sex can be conceptualized in plural ways. I would further contend that this actually better describes actual research practice. And it calls on researchers to contextually define sex-related biological variables and to justify their choices as to how and whether they operationalize and analyze sex-related biological variation. If you're interested in this approach, um, I offer a teaching slide deck, um, an explainer, and an interview um, uh, on the Gender Sci Lab website. There's the original article, and I'm always interested in collaborations with scientists to test and extend this framework for thinking about sex. Um, there are a range of additional resources and suggested readings um, that I have available on these slides, which I'll share.
and also on the Gender Sci website. And I want to thank the collaborative work of the Gender Sci Lab at Harvard um, for helping to develop these ideas. We are a thoroughly interdisciplinary group that works to advance concepts and methods and theories for scientific research on sex and gender. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was that was also amazing. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. I want to like quickly move into questions because we we have some like limited time. So we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, but I will try to get answers to questions that we can't get to. So the first question for the panelists is um, how should authors label their data and discuss them if they use historical data where it is uncertain the labeling for sex or gender were accurate? to our current standards? And this is a question for anyone on the panel. I'm happy to take our first crack at that, if that would be helpful. Uh -huh. uh, so I think there's a couple of questions of this sort of general variety, which is like, hey, like, uh, if I didn't gather the data, if it's like, you know, if I know that the data was like, you know, how should we talk about it? And I think the first sort of thing that I would emphasize is I think that I understand, like, I think there's this instinct to be like, we want to talk about this in an inclusive way. And then like, that's totally valuable. But if the data is actually not inclusive, right, and is was produced in a way that was not inclusive, like using inclusive language can often be deceptive, right. And like, I think that, um, you know, one thing, one actual really amazing story that came out of the patterns piece, which I think is a really good example here is that, so one of the the papers we talked about was the paper on suicidality that sort of exhibited sex gender slippage. Um, and we were pretty sure that the data that they had was actually sex data because we knew it was from Vanderbilt um, and Vanderbilt Medical Center had made it really public when they had started gathering gender identity data for people who were in uh, under their medical care. So we knew that their data predated the gender identity move. And so we wrote about this and sort of said, hey, we think this is what's happened. And actually the PI on the research like posted on Twitter saying like, this is totally what's happened. You know, we did have the sex data from the EHR. Should we publish a correction? And we, I was like so shocked by the idea that someone would take this seriously enough to publish a correction. It was really awesome. Um, but my point here is that uh, just saying what you know and what you don't know is really valuable to people who are trying to actually apply a more like as Sarah was saying, like contextual approach to your data in other contexts or just understand what you're doing. So I think just being clear about what circumstances the data was gathered and what what information you have, whether it's data that you gathered or data that's historical and someone else gathered, I think is valuable. And I think sort of, you know, noting that it's not the same way you would gather data now, I think can also be helpful to just be clear about sort of the values of the folks producing the research. Thank you, Kendra. Does anyone have anything else to add? Let's just move on to the next question then. So this is like an amalgam of questions basically, but um, what should scientists be taking into account regarding human gender and sex when they design studies and study questionnaires but that many scientists aren't accounting for? Relatedly, how should researchers ask about sex and gender when collecting data? And what else do you think that editors, journals, and organizations can and should do to help build a culture of data richness? Oh, any volunteers? I can I can jump in a little bit on that. There's there's a lot of writing about this. Um, so there are um, there there's a kind of gold standard right now of doing a two part uh, gender question. These are things you can easily look up. Um, but I think the key point is to think critically about why you are collecting gender data. Right? Not more data is not always better. And any collection of data can pose risks to study populations. So is gender and sex, in fact, a relevant data to your research question? One of the, in one of my slides, I pointed out that there's a rich literature on uh, common problems um, and in inferences in biomedical research around sex differences. And one, one of the reasons that we have that problem is that so much biomedical data is standardly tagged with sex, even though there's no a priori reason to do so. And so people just run analyses by sex. Um, so think about why you're collecting it and if it is germane to your research question. 
Um, and um, also think about the potential impacts to a research population if inferences are made around sex and gender related to your question. Um, I'll just give one small example of a recent paper by the epidemiologist Greta Bauer, who did an analysis of um, the of, of analyzing a study population by um, presence or absence of a uterus rather than by um, sex or gender. And what Greta showed is that um, by using just male or female uh, sex gender signifier, um, analyses of uterine cancer rates had underestimated rates of uterine cancer for African Americans relevant relative to white Americans. And this is because of higher rates of hysterectomy in that population. So mathematically, what you ended up doing is obscuring variation within um, and not taking account of um, these varying, the, the specific sex-related factor of interest. So I just wanna bring it back to that point of um, sex contextualism, of understanding the variable that's of interest and getting as close as possible to that in what you're collecting for your research study. Acknowledging this is very hard with historical data um, and it's critical as Kendra pointed out in answering the last question, there's a useful term called data biography to um, actually tell the story of how the data was collected and acknowledge the limitations of inferences from that data if it doesn't include such practices. Thank you, Sarah. If I can just add quickly, if that's okay. I think that I, yeah, I really appreciate Sarah's answer. And I think to some extent, some of you know the same sort of uh, contextual analysis that she's describing is something actually that uh, uh, my co-author Maggie and then another co-author of mine, uh, Denai and I have sort of been working on a more recent paper that talks about doing this within the context of gender, because I think we often um, very reasonably, uh, you know, use gender as a variable without engaging that in that same kind of contextual analysis about like what, what kinds of gendered phenomenon are actually the things that we're studying. Um, and I think that helps, you know, like, thinking, yeah, thinking about your research problem and sort of the background literature and understanding how sex and gender might play, like what hypotheses you have about sex and gender and then gathering your data um, about it in that way, I think leads to much more accurate outcomes because you can actually ask the question that is like, you want the answer to, as opposed to using these like big variables that mean are, that are um, not necessarily contextually appropriate or like not necessarily particularly, particularly accurate. In terms of gendered questions, I think that there's a lot of uh, conversation about this. I think um, the best thing I would probably do is think about whether there are sort of trusted community members amongst the folks who that you are working with um, or who are potentially like uh, human subjects who you'll be working with who can help you understand what how you might get the most accurate gender information for the context in which you're working, which may in some sorts of circumstances be the kind of historical the sort of two step question, but in other circumstances may actually be other means of getting at gender because I think sometimes those two step questions uh, are meant for the idea of like when you're when you have when you have to ask every single one when you need one gender question to rule them all rather than a much more specific analysis based on the context in which you're doing the research thank you kendra so unfortunately we're at the hour now so there's a lot of really good questions and what i'm going to do is try to post these to the panelists separately over email and try to um, get answers to people um, and as, as we close, I'd just like to offer a thanks, first and foremost, to the panelists for their time and amazing presentations. And again, to my colleagues, Kelsey Walther. She's a founding project manager of this speaker series, and she's done an enormous amount of work for this panel and the series in general. Also, Leila Brinzia and Diana Osterley, who joined us a little bit late, but they've been incredibly helpful behind the scenes. And even though um, she's not with Self Press anymore, Gracie Griffin is the other co-founder of this uh, project and also Kyle Lim. We're circulating or putting a feedback form in the link in the chat. It would be great if as many people as possible could fill this out because it'll help inform how we run our next panels. Speaking of which, we have forthcoming panels on neurodiversity, 
race and ethnicity, and health conditions and disability. We don't have dates yet set, but keep an eye on your inbox. And with that, I'd like to close out this session of the self Press Inclusive Language Speaker Series. Thank you again to all our panelists, my colleagues, and everyone for coming. Thank you.